Caliban and the Witch, The State Intervention in the Reproduction of Labor, Poor Relief, and the Criminalization of the Working Class. The struggle for food was not the only front in the battle against the spread of capitalist relations. Everywhere, masses of people resisted the destruction of their former ways of existence, fighting against land privatization, the abolition of customary rights, the imposition of new taxes, wage dependence, and the continuous presence of armies in their neighborhoods, which was so hated that people rushed to close the gates of their towns to prevent soldiers from settling among them. In France, 1,000, quote, emotions, uprisings, occurred between the 1530s and 1670s, many involving entire provinces and requiring the intervention of troops. England, Italy, and Spain present a similar picture, indicating that the pre-capitalist world of the village, which Marx dismissed under the rubric of, quote, rural isolation, could produce as high a level of struggle as any the industrial proletariat has waged. Footnote. On the 16th and 17th century protest in Europe, see Henry Kamen, The Iron Century, in particular Chapter 10. As Kamen writes, quote, The crisis of 1595-7 to was operative throughout Europe, with repercussions in England, France, Austria, Finland, Hungary, Lithuania, and Ukraine. Probably never before in European history had so many popular rebellions coincided in time. End quote. There were rebellions in Naples in 1595, 1620, 1647. In Spain, rebellions erupted in 1640 in Catalonia, in Grenada in 1648, in Cordoba and Seville in 1652. For riots and rebellions in 16th and 17th century England, see Cornwall, Underdown, and Manning. On revolt in Spain and Italy, see also Brodel. End of footnote. In the Middle Ages, migration, vagabondage, and the rise of, quote, crimes against property were part of the resistance to impoverishment and dispossession. These phenomena now took on massive proportions. Everywhere, if we give credit to the complaints of the contemporary authorities, vagabonds were swarming, changing cities, crossing borders, sleeping in the haystacks, or crowding at the gates of towns. A vast humanity involved in a diaspora of its own that for decades escaped the authorities' control. 6,000 vagabonds were reported in Venice alone in 1545. Quote, In Spain, vagrants cluttered the road, stopping at every town. Footnote. On vagrancy in Europe, beside Bayer and Garamek, see Braudel and Cayman. End of footnote. Starting with England, always a pioneer in these matters, the state passed new, far harsher anti-vagabond laws prescribing enslavement and capital punishment in cases of recidivism. But repression was not effective, and the roads of 16th and 17th century Europe remained places of great commotion and encounters. Through them passed heretics escaping persecution, discharged soldiers, journeymen, and other, quote, humble folk, in search of employment, and then foreign artisans, evicted peasants, prostitutes, hucksters, petty thieves, professional beggars. Above all, through the roads of Europe pass the tales, stories, and experiences of a developing proletariat. Meanwhile, the crime rates also escalated, in such proportions that we can assume that a massive reclamation and reappropriation of the stolen communal wealth was underway. Footnote on the rise of property crimes in the wake of the Price Revolution, see Richard J. Evans, Cayman, and Lee Soli. Lee Soli write that, quote, The available evidence suggests that the overall crime rate did indeed rise markedly in Elizabethan and early Stuart England, especially between 1590 and 1620. End of footnote. Today, these aspects of the transition to capitalism may seem, for Europe at least, things of the past, or, as Marx put it in the Grundrisse, quote, historical preconditions of capitalist development, to be overcome by more mature forms of capitalism. But the essential similarity between these phenomena and the social consequences of the new phase of globalization that we are witnessing tells us otherwise. 
pauperization, rebellion, and the escalation of, quote, crime, are structural elements of capitalist accumulation, as capitalism must strip the workforce from its means of reproduction to impose its own rule. A picture. A vagrant being whipped through the streets. That in the industrializing regions of Europe, by the 19th century, the most extreme forms of proletarian misery and rebellion had disappeared is not a proof against this claim. Proletarian misery and rebellions did not come to an end. They only lessened to the degree that the super-exploitation of workers had been exported, through the institutionalization of slavery at first, and later through the continuing expansion of colonial domination. As for the, quote, transition period, this remained in Europe a time of intense social conflict, providing the stage for a set of state initiatives that, judging from their effects, have three main objectives. A, to create a more disciplined workforce. B, to diffuse social protest. And C, to fix workers to the jobs forced upon them. Let us look at them in turn. In pursuit of social discipline, an attack was launched against all forms of collective sociality and sexuality, including sports, games, dances, ale wakes, festivals, and other group rituals that had been a source of bonding and solidarity among workers. It was sanctioned by a deluge of bills, 25 in England, just for the regulation of alehouses in the years between 1601 and 06. Peter Burke, in his work on the subject, has spoken of it as a campaign against, quote, popular culture. But we can see that what was at stake was the desocialization, or decollectivization, of the reproduction of the workforce, as well as the attempt to impose a more productive use of leisure time. This process, in England, reached its climax with the coming to power of the Puritans in the aftermath of the Civil War, 1642-49. to when the fear of social indiscipline prompted the banning of all proletarian gatherings and merrymaking. But the, quote, moral reformation was equally intense in non-Protestant areas, where, in the same period, religious processions were replacing the dancing and singing that had been held in and out of the churches. Even the individual's relation with God was privatized. In the Protestant areas, with the institution of a direct relationship between the individual and the divinity, in the Catholic areas, with the introduction of individual confession. The church itself, as a community center, ceased to host any social activity other than those addressed to the cult. As a result, the physical enclosure operated by land privatization and the hedging of the commons was amplified by a process of social enclosure the reproduction of workers shifting from the open field to the home, from the community to the family, from the public space, the common, the church, to the private. Footnote. In England, among the moments of sociality and collective reproduction that were terminated due to the loss of open fields and the commons, there were the processions that were held in the spring to bless the fields, which could no longer take place once the fields were fenced off and the dances that were held around the Maypole on May 1st. End footnote. Secondly, in the decades between 1530 and 1560, a system of public assistance was introduced in at least 60 European towns, both by initiative of the local municipalities and by direct intervention of the central state. See Lease and Soli on the Institution of Public Assistance. See Garamek's Poverty, a History, Chapter 4, The Reform of Charity. End footnote. Its precise goals are still debated. While much of the literature on the topic sees the introduction of public assistance as a response to a humanitarian crisis that jeopardized social control, in his massive study of coerced labor, the French Marxist scholar Jan moulier Bouton insists that its primary objective was, quote, the great fixation of the proletariat, that is, the attempt to prevent the flight of labor. Footnote. I only partially agree with Molière Bouton when he claims that poor relief was not so much a response to the misery produced by land expropriation and price inflation, but a measure intended to prevent the flight of workers and thereby create a local labor market. 
As already mentioned, Moliere Bouton overemphasizes the degree of mobility available to the dispossessed proletariat, as he does not consider the different situation of women. Furthermore, he underplays the degree to which assistance was the result of a struggle to the flight of labor, but included assaults, the invasion of towns by masses of starving rural people, a constant feature in mid-16th century France, and other forms of attack. It is not coincidence in this context that Norwich, the center of the Cat Rebellion, became, shortly after its defeat, the center and the model of poor relief reforms. End footnote. In any event, the introduction of public assistance was a turning point in the state relation between workers and capital, and the definition of the function of the state. It was the first recognition of the unsustainability of a capitalist system ruling exclusively by means of hunger and terror. It was also the first step in the reconstruction of the state as the guarantor of the class relation, and as the chief supervisor of the reproduction and disciplining of the workforce. Antecedents for this function can be found in the 14th century, when, faced with the generalization of the anti-feudal struggle, the state had emerged as the only agency capable of confronting a working class that was regionally unified, armed, and no longer confined in its demands to the political economy of the manor. In 1351, with the passing of the Statute of Laborers in England, which fixed the maximum wage, the state had formally taken charge of the regulation and repression of labor, which the local lords were no longer capable of guaranteeing. But it was with the introduction of public assistance that the state began to claim, quote, ownership of the workforce, and a capitalist, quote, division of labor, was instituted within the ruling class, enabling employers to relinquish any responsibility for the reproduction of workers, in the certainty that the state would intervene, either with the carrot or with the stick, to address the inevitable crises. With this innovation, a leap also occurred in the management of social reproduction, resulting in the introduction of demographic recording, census-taking, the recording of mortality, natality, marriage rates, and the application of accounting to social relations. Exemplary is the work of the administrators of the Bureau de Pauvre in Lyon, France, who, by the end of the 16th century, had learned to calculate the number of the poor, assess the amount of food needed by each child or adult, and keep track of the deceased to make sure that nobody could claim assistance in the name of a dead person. Along with this new, quote, social science, an international debate also developed on the administration of public assistance, anticipating the contemporary debate on welfare. Should only those unable to work, described as the, quote, deserving poor, be supported? Or should, quote, able-bodied laborers unable to find a job also be given help? And how much or how little should they be given so as not to be discouraged from looking for work? These questions were crucial from the viewpoint of social discipline, as a key objective of public aid was to tie workers to their jobs. But on these matters, a consensus could rarely be reached. While humanist reformers like Juan Luis Vives and spokesmen for the wealthy burghers recognized the economic and disciplinary benefits of a more liberal and centralized dispensation of charity, not exceeding the distribution of bread, however, Part of the clergy strenuously opposed the ban on individual donations. Footnote. The Spanish humanist Juan Luis Vives, who was knowledgeable about the poor relief systems of the Flanders and Spain, was one of the main supporters of public charity. In his De Subvention Pauperum, 1526, he argued that, quote, secular authority rather than the church should be responsible for the aid to the poor. He also stressed that authorities should find work for the able-bodied, insisting that, quote, the dissolute, the crooked, the thieving, and the idle should be given the hardest work, and the most badly paid, in order that their example might serve as a deterrent to others. End footnote. But, across differences of systems and opinions, assistance was administered with such stinginess that it generated as much conflict as appeasement. Those assisted resented the humiliating rituals imposed on them, 
like wearing the, quote, mark of infamy, previously reserved for lepers and Jews. Or in France, participating in the annual processions of the poor, in which they had to parade singing hymns and holding candles. And they vehemently protested when the alms were not promptly given, or were inadequate to their needs. In response, in some French towns, gibbets were erected at the time of food distributions, or when the poor were asked to work in exchange for the food they received. In England, as the 16th century progressed, receipt of public aid, also for children and the elderly, was made conditional on the incarceration of the recipients in, quote, workhouses, where they became the experimental subjects for a variety of work schemes. Footnote. The main work on the rise of the workhouse and correction houses is Dario Melosi and Massimo Pavarini, The Prison and the Factory, Origins of the Penitentiary System. The authors point out that the main purpose of incarceration was to break the sense of identity and solidarity of the poor. See also Garamek. On the schemes concocted by English proprietors to incarcerate the poor in their parishes, see Marx, Capital, Volume 1. For France, see Foucault, Madness and Civilization, especially Chapter 2, The Great Confinement. End of footnote. Consequently, the attack on workers that had begun with the enclosures and the price revolution in the space of a century led to the criminalization of the working class. That is, the formation of a vast proletariat, either incarcerated in the newly constructed workhouses and correction houses, or seeking its survival outside the law and living in open antagonism to the state, always one step away from the whip and the noose. From the viewpoint of the formation of a laborious workforce, this was a decisive failure, and the constant preoccupation with the question of social discipline in 16th and 17th century political circles indicates that the contemporary statesmen and entrepreneurs were keenly aware of it. Moreover, the social crisis that this general state of rebelliousness provoked was aggravated in the second half of the 16th century by a new economic contraction in great part caused by the dramatic population decline that occurred in Spanish America after the conquest and the shrinking of the colonial economies. End of section.